Our next speaker <coughs> is uh, Tatiana Trejos, who is from the International Forensic Research Institute at Florida International University in Miami. And she's going to talk about evaluation of the performance of different match criteria for the comparison of elemental composition of glass by micro XRF, ICPMS, uh, laser ablation, ICPMS, and laser induced breakdown spectroscopy. First of all, I would like to thank um, all the organizers for uh, such a wonderful workshop and for the opportunity to come here and present some of this data. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the evaluation of the performance of match criteria for the comparison of glass, elemental composition of glass, by different techniques. So in order to evaluate the effect of the match criteria on glass comparisons, the Elemental Analysis Working Group decided to conduct four interlaboratory studies or round robin. And even though we met in advance to look at the overall design of the round robins and the aims for each of these tests, all the samples were submitted to the participants as blind tests to avoid any bias on the results and the reporting of the results. So for the first round robin, uh, we focus on the evaluation of the analytical performance of the methods to see how we compare to the others, and also to evaluate and assess the match criteria that each laboratory was using at that moment in their agency. For the second round robin and the succeeding round robins, uh, we design them based on the discussions that we have in the group and the experience that we gained from the previous round robin studies. So for the second one, we decided to make a larger set of standard reference materials to e further evaluate the analytical performance of the methods and also include some samples for comparisons to evaluate type one and type two errors. The third round robin uh, was uh, more focused on the evaluation of false inclusions, while the fourth round robin wa was more focused on the evaluation of false exclusions. So there were two main questions that we wanted to answer uh, to, uh, with the study of these round robins. Uh, one is dealing with the analytical performance of the methods and the second one related to the match criteria. So in terms of the analytical performance, uh, we wanted to know how each technique performed uh, versus the others in terms of precision, accuracy, sensitivity, limitations, interferences, discrimination capability, how um, consistency we can get results among the participants. And also uh, something of interest in our group was to study or work towards the standardization of the methods. And we are very close to submit uh, two, AS, two methods to, uh, for consideration to the ASTM uh, as a product of this group, one related to micro XRF and the other one for laser ablation ICPMS of glass analysis. In terms of match criteria, what we wanted to do is to evaluate the effect of sampling strategies as well as the selection of the match criteria on the error rates for elemental comparison of glass. And of course, one of the interests of the group was to take a look at the interpretation of the significance of an association when one is found. So these graphs here represent uh, the number of participant laboratories uh, that we get for each of the round robins. So we get about 14 to 18 different laboratories that participated in each of the round robin. And as you can see, the majority of the data will come from ICP users and XRF uh, analysis. Uh, ICP included data from digestion followed by ICPMS analysis laser ablation, ICPMS, as well as laser ablation coupled to ICP OES. And one of the important things about the number of participants that we get in this round robin is that we gather enough data from different techniques, different methods uh, taken uh, by different analysts at different locations, different instruments, brands, and configurations. So we get enough data to do inter and interlab variation studies. So this is an example of the results for the second round robin um, where we were comparing the analytical performance 
This is an example of lithium uh, present at about 5 ppm in the standard reference material 1831. And this is the comparison of the results obtained for the participants of the ITP users. And as you can see, each laboratory was able to compare their individual precision and accuracy versus the study mean and the certified value. So we got excellent agreement between the participants in terms of precision and accuracy it was uh, from the majority of the elements better than 10%. And uh, one important thing is that these studies uh, led to the standardization of the methods, uh, choosing the methods, improving, uh, finding some outliers, and uh, that uh, was important as a validation process also for uh, the members of the group. The second round robin consisted also of, of three samples that we submitted for comparison to simulate a case work, a case, um, and so those samples were architectural floor glass that was manufactured in the Cardinal plant. K1 and Q1 share a common origin, and they were manufactured in 2001, while Q2 originating from a different source manufactured in the same plant, but years apart. And before I uh, present the results for the different match criteria that the, I, uh, we evaluated, I would like to present really briefly a description of how the data display and how we call uh, an association. So uh, for XRF, or micro XRF, uh, the participants of the examiners, usually the first thing that they do is to look at the spectra of the Ks and the Qs and compare to see if they can find any significant differences in the spectra. So once they have done the comparison of the spectra overlay, they can also take a look and do intensities, ratios of the intensities, to look at the data um, in a numerical way. So uh, when we asked during the protocol of the analysis, when we submitted the interlaboratory test, is that they report at least six to eight ratios for the sample. And we requested to take at least nine to 10 measurements of the K before comparing to the measurements with the Q samples. <coughs> the LIPS data will look very similar to the micro XRF, so I didn't have a slide specifically for LIPS, but we also have uh, an spectra and they are gonna also have a ratios of intensity of the elements that they can be looking at. In the case of ICPMS data, we get quantitative information. So what we have is the concentration of elements present in very low concentrations in PMs. Uh, so we look about uh, 16, to si 16 to 18 different elements present in the low PPM range for uh, trace and main uh, elements. And same thing, uh, we requested at least 10 measurements of the known samples and at least three measurements of each of the question fragments. So once we have the numerical data and we selected a match criteria, if the K and the Q are significantly different, but at least one out of those 18 elements or one out of those eight ratios, then we can exclude the samples to have come from the same source. If we fail to find any differences in any of those elements, then we call that an association. So with this said, uh, I'm gonna present here a table where represent the results for the comparison of those samples for the second round robin, as reported by each laboratory using their own match criteria. So something that I want you to know here is that the match criteria that was reported for the second round robin in changes a lot between participants. Uh, everybody was using their own match criteria, different match criteria in their agency. So we had t-test uh, with 95% confidence, range overlap, two, three, or four standard deviation, or a spectra overlay as the match criteria of choice. And as you can see here, uh, in the second round robin, we got 100% correct association of the samples that originated from the same source and as well, all the participants were able to correctly discriminate the samples that came from different sources. 
So due to the encouraging results that we get in the second round robin, we tried to make um, the test every time more challenging to the participants. Uh, so for the third round robin, what we did is that we asked each participant to compare the uh, elemental analysis of the samples that we submitted as K1 versus all the question items. In this particular test, there's three question items and also a second K with all the question items. And the samples that we submitted for the analysis were manufactured in the same plant. It was a cardinal plant. And they were manufactured years apart, months apart, and weeks apart. So we wanted to know what was the discrimination capabilities of the methods when those intervals in time in the same plan come closer. So this is an example of the data prior distribution of the analysis. Uh, this was taken with the laser ablation ICPMS. And as you can see, for example, here um, with the yellow, highlighted in yellow, as the samples cl get closer in time, the composition of the elements look very, very similar. And I highlighted in red the elements that were responsible for the differences or the major differences between the samples. So you can see that some of them are present in very low concentrations, so not all the techniques may be able to detect those differences. That's what we expected uh, in advance. So this is uh, a summary of the comparison results for those samples that were manufactured at least two years apart as reported by each of the participants, again, using their own mass criteria. So as you can see, all the participants were able to discriminate the samples that originated from the different sources, regardless of the method that they were applying and the match criteria that they selected. The only two exceptions uh, is CSR, one of the LIPS laboratory, that they were using their own mathematical algorithm, and after this, they fine-tuned the method as they found some errors in the code. And we also have an inconclusive result for one of the acid digestion ICPMS uh, participants because they had a problem with one of the samples and they didn't have enough sample to repeat the analysis, so they called it inconclusive. But um, other than that, we were able to discriminate all the samples correctly. When the samples uh, were closer, closer in time of manufacturing, only the more sensitive methods like ICPMS and LIPS were able to discriminate the samples that were manufactured a few weeks or months apart. So the summary for this third round robin is that uh, this round robin allowed the study of type two errors in samples that were very similar in composition. So we took this in the worst case scenario, we took from our database the samples that were more close in composition and in time. Uh, however, all the techniques were able to differentiate samples that were manufactured in the same plant months, uh, two, mon two or three months apart, regardless of the match criteria that they selected for the analysis. The samples that were very, very similar in composition, uh, and they were manufactured only two weeks apart, were only differentiated by the methods that were more sensitive, like the ICP and some of the LIPS laboratories. So for the four round robin, we decided to study a little bit uh, more uh, the type one errors. So we uh, collected samples from our database from Pilkington plant. Uh, so we have the Q1, was manufactured in February of 2010, and all the other samples that we submitted for comparison originated from the same source, manufactured in the same plant, just two weeks apart. This is an example of the pre-distribution analysis by laser ablation ICPMS, and so it's something that I want you to note here uh, is that in this particular plant, so these particular samples, even though these samples were manufactured only two weeks apart, you can note that there are significant differences in the elemental composition. So in comparison to the previous one, we were expecting most of the laboratories to be able to find these differences in these samples, even though they were manufactured only two weeks apart. And this is the summary of the results as reported by the XRF participants using their own match criteria. 
And something that I want you to note here is that by this four round robin, you can see how the participants were having a much better agreement in the match criteria that they were selecting for um, doing their comparison. Using uh, this match criteria, the all the participants were able to discriminate correctly the samples that were manufactured two weeks apart, and all of them were able to associate correctly the samples that originated from the same source. When the measurements were taken with more sensitive methods, still all the participants were able to discriminate the samples that were manufactured two weeks apart. However, we uh, start seeing some type one errors in some of the fragments. And something that I want uh, you to note here is that the still the ITP uses, we were using like a large variety of match criteria for the four round robin. And um, in this particular case, this raise a flag uh, to the participants that we may need to use a wider match criteria for ITPMS data due to the nature of the analytical technique that we get very sensitive and the precision is very tight between measurements. So that could contribute uh, in the increased rate of type one errors. For the LIPS participants, we got uh, similar results where we have some type one errors. However, we also had some type two errors reported, which we attributed to the fact that in comparison to the other methods, LIPS uh, still lack of standardization among the, in the participant laboratory. So there was a lot of variation of variables and even the ratios that we're using for comparisons. So because the rate of type one errors that we got in the forum rolling for the ICP data was very like a typical of what we have observed in, in over the years uh, based on our database and studies that have been conducted in the past, we decided to take a closer look to see what could have been also the cause of those errors. So here's a little bit of our history about the source of the samples. They were ma uh, taken from a manufacturing plant, the processing plant, that was having a transition at the moment of the iron content due to customer requirements. So you can see that over the, the time, they were going from low concentration of iron to high iron and so on. They reported an important transition in this area in these dates in 2010, and the samples that were taken to evaluate the type one errors were sampled just four days before this big transition in the plant. So uh, the group uh, was interested in looking uh, more closely at the heterogeneity of those samples to see uh, how that compares to other samples that we typically have in the laboratory. So we conducted an homogeneity study where we took all uh, those still synchron samples that were included in the four round robin, and also a, a pane of glass from the cardinal plant that was used in the third round robin. So we conducted an homogeneity study to evaluate the variation within a pane. So we took five to seven fragments per set and do a comparison of the elemental composition. But we also look at the spatial variation within the fragments. So we did comparison of the elemental composition in the float side versus the non-float side, and also in different areas of the cross section. And this is an example of what we observe for the cardinal plant. Uh, this is just iron concentration in here. And you can see this is the mean value and the standard deviation for each of the measurements. We didn't find significant differences across the section of the uh, glass in the cardinal samples. However, you can note here a significant difference in the concentration of iron across the glass, not only for the float versus the non-float, but also within the cross section. For this particular round robin, the participants requested that they wanted to have the samples as small as possible to be representative of what they have in real cases. So we submit a sample that were very small and they were irregular in shape. So chances are that the samples that were submitted as two samples originated from different sources, different areas of the cross section. And therefore that may explain uh, why we got such a high rate on type one errors for uh, the four round robin.
So after that, we requested each participant to take their own data and apply all these match criteria to compare the error rate that we can get with under different circumstances. So we requested range overlap, t-test at different p-values, t-test with the one Ferroni correction, hotel in C for some of the set, and then two all the way to six standard deviation with and without a minimum 3% RFD. So this is the summary of the results for the micro XRF for the three round robin study. So as you can see, this is for type two errors. Uh, we were able, or they were able to discriminate correctly all the samples submitted for round robin two and round robin four, regardless of the match criteria that was employed. However, you can see that there are uh, more type two errors in the round robin three due to the nature of the test. Uh, some techniques uh, perform better than others. Um, however, I, we have to notice that the samples that produced these errors were samples that were manufactured only two weeks or three months apart. So they had very similar elemental composition. In terms of type one errors, um, in most cases, the failure to associate the samples uh, were obtained uh, for techniques that uh, where like to test a range, uh, range overlap, three standard deviation, spectra overlay, and hotel in C perform much better than the other comparison methods in terms of type one error. For the ICP methods, in terms of type two errors, again, uh, very good ability to discriminate samples in round robin two and round robin three. We got uh, some percentage of type two errors in round robin three. However, all these came from samples that were manufactured only two weeks apart for some laboratories that were not able to discriminate the samples. In terms of type one errors, uh, if you look here at the round robin four, you can see that there is a higher type one error associated uh, mainly to the heterogeneity of the sample as I previously described, um, particularly for this transition in the plant. Nonetheless, uh, you can see here that still for the second round rowing that was uh, taken from samples from that cardinal plant, we get some type one errors depending on the match criteria that was selected. So four standard deviation and four standard deviation with minimum three uh, percent RFD provided better um, rates for type one errors. But I want you to uh, take a closer look at the round robin two, taking the four standard deviation, which will have about 26 percent rate for type one errors. Five of 19 of the comparisons were the responsible to give uh, that 26 percent type one error in the round robin two. However, um, these errors came from two out of seven laboratories and only in one element per laboratory. So these are the examples. This is one of the laboratories, comparison of K versus all the Q fragments. Another laboratory, comparison of the K with the Q fragments. Only magnesium, only potassium were discriminated or excluded in the sample. And I want you to know here when we use the four uh, standard deviation that the samples are very close in composition. However, because of the excellent precision that is typically observed in laser elation ICP main measurement, these tiny uh, small uh, differences were responsible for excluding those samples only for one out of 18 elements. So uh, one of the things that was uh, studied uh, presented in the group is uh, due to the reduce like the precision that we got in ICP measurement. We decided that we can use four standard deviation, uh, four, uh, four S as the criteria, but instead of using the re relative standard deviation of the measurement, we can fix that value to 3% when the precision is that small. And this is a method that has been in use uh, by the CFS in, in Canada and the BKA. They recently reported in 2011 in the Journal of Analytical Atomic Spectroscopy. All the fundamentals behind that, they perform a very nice study uh, to evaluate the different type one and type two errors under different circumstances 
and they found that these criteria provided the less number of type one and type two errors. So we also evaluated this match criteria uh, for our round robin in the case of ICP data. Even though this match criteria may look a little bit wide for what we have typically used in the past, um, we noticed that when we use this match criteria, we reduce the type one error without really sacrificing the type two errors. And the reason for that is that if you look here at this graph, it, this represent the different elements and each data point represent the concentration and the standard deviation for those measurements. When the samples are um, originated from different sources, like in the case of the orange trend versus the blue and the green one, they differ not only by one element, by, by, but by many elements that with many standard deviations. So if those, those uh, two samples came from different sources, even if we wipe uh, a little bit the match criteria, we'll still be able to find those differences. So in terms of recommendations uh, learned from this study, in terms of sampling, what we recommend is to take as much measurements as practical so a minimum of nine measurements for the uh, case samples is recommended to really um, take a um, representation of the variation of the elemental composition of the sample uh, and take into account the heterogeneity of the samples. In case of XRF data, uh, also appropriate samples should uh, account for differences in size of the fragments and different geometries. In terms of quality assurance, and. Uh, Christine uh, gave a talk about that yesterday as well uh, in much more detail. What we recommend is to use an evaluation or a console standard to evaluate precision and accuracy in a daily basis in their laboratory. And one easy way of doing that is measuring a, a reference standard material like 1831. And also conduct a study in their laboratories to evaluate the method detection limits and method classification limits, precision and accuracy so that you can uh, know when to call a peak and peak and when to use those for comparisons. And Troy did an excellent job yesterday describing all um, the idea behind it. In terms of ICP, what we learned is that we need to open a little bit the match criteria, make it a little bit wider. So four standard deviation or the four standard deviations with 3% error use reduce the less amount of type one and type two errors. For XRF data, a spectra overlay seems to perform well, and that's one of the techniques preferred by the XRF users. Also, the use of ratios for comparisons can be used with the match criteria of range overlap or three standard deviation, which have shown to perform well for XRF data. Hotelin C, which is a multivariate uh, QFS, also performs well for the XRF data. So it can be considered as well as an alternative match criteria for elemental composition and comparison. So finally, in terms of interpretation, uh, the take home message for these studies is that glass samples that are manufactured in different plants or even in the same plant at very short uh, time intervals, weeks or months, depending on the techniques and the variation of the plant, are clearly differentiated by the methods that were evaluated. And therefore, uh, we think that we can use this statement as a start point to add in significance to the evaluation of the elemental composition and mass criteria for the comparison of classes. I would like to thank the NIJ for funding this grant, and of course, all the members for the Elemental Analysis Working Group and particularly Dr. Robert Kunz that helped a lot with the data analysis and discussions relating the match criteria. Thank you. I think we really had three in, uh, very interesting talks there. We're running a little bit late, but I thought since the importance of, of these talks was worth uh, giving them their allotted time. Um, let me start by asking, are there any questions from the audience? There are microphones uh, here, and I guess that microphones out there, and if you have a question, you might step up. <laughs> 
elemental analyses, what elements were selected for the copper wires for the differentiation? Um, I think for the most part, um, I think about 10, um, we, I, I can't remember all of them, um, but I know that molybdenum, vanadium, titanium, um, iron, and I can't remember the others um, were included in that study. Other questions? It seemed to me that homogeneity and heterogeneity of the samples was an important consideration for all of your you know, studies. And uh, particularly when you're aiming a laser at a small spot on a larger sample, the homogeneity of the analysis across the surface is of importance and of consideration. Um, would you like to start by saying something more about you know, homogeneity of your work and um, hom homogeneity of samples in your work with respect to SURI? Yeah, I can, I can say something about that. Um, as far as the tattoos was a very good example of, of a heterogeneous sample and um, the Raman microscope itself, um, that, that example was done with normal dispersive Raman, not with, with Sears itself. Um, and so in that case, because it was a solid sample, we were able to focus in on, on an area and get scattering from essentially the diameter of the laser, which is, is very small. Um, when it comes to Sears work, however, um, if we were to then take that solid sample and add silver, um, anything that would be soluble that would be able to go onto the particle would it could be on the particle. So you could get mixtures um, and get um, multiple components. So um, separation methods are um, important. However, with that said, with Sears, there are some compounds that are much more Sears active than others. Um, things with, with long chains don't give very good Sears spectra. Things with, with uh, more ring groups are going to give you much stronger signals. So there's there's that, uh, that aspect that can help separate some sort of um, signal and be able to identify what's there. Mm -hmm. Megan, let me ask you, you're using, using a laser to focus and, and do laser uh, uh, inductive recovery plasma mesh and um, again, you're focusing on a small part of the sample um, and you've, you've looked at variations across some of your materials. What kind of percent variation do you see? Do you, do you, do you ever see a dramatic change in the signal at some point in, on the sample? Um, actually, yes, we do see some dramatic changes, especially around the edges of the sample um, or parts that have been intentionally contaminated. Um, as far as um, the other, like just the rest of the sample, uh, we don't see much um, range in um, our, our Um, we don't see much uh, much range, which is nice, um, especially as an advantage of IPP. Obviously, we're interested in reproducibility of results, but you know, sometimes with some of these probe methods, the identification of an additional material on the sample might be of probative value too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Titania, okay, so at the end you said nine measurements or more if possible, and sample three fragments of glass, if possible. You know, we had some discussions in our statistics workshop on Monday, and my joke was, this is the question that statisticians hate the worst. How many measurements should I take? And their usual answer is, take more, because that's always better. Um, but uh, I think that your, your, your uh, comment about taking samples from multiple fragments also speaks to heterogeneity across fragments. And in your data set, were what, what how, how did the results compare taking measurements across different fragments, or did you look at that aspect of da the data? We also conducted some uh, heterogeneity studies that we didn't discuss due to time constraints, um, but we did some comparison of the heterogeneity of containers versus float glass, for example. And containers are typically more heterogeneous, so what we recommend is to take more measurements in the case of containers than multiple fragments. It's always better to take a measurements from multiple, a single measurement from multiple fragments that take like three fragments and then three measurements in each of the fragments. If you have more than three fragments in the cave, which is usually the case, what we recommend is take as many measurements as possible, minimum nine, and if possible, one measurement per fragment so that we can have an idea of the variation, a representation of the variation of that heterogeneity in the sample before we 
do any comparisons with these two samples but that are usually more limited in size. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions from the audience? Yep, please step up. I believe this might be a statistician. It's not a statistical question. Uh, interested in your study of the heterogeneity of the plate glass, did you also sample sideways on the, on the, you know, if you have a big plate and take different areas on the big plate? We have done uh, heterogeneity studies in different manufacturing plants uh, at FIU. For this particular set, we have a limited size of samples, so the panes were about this big, so the heterogeneity was in like not in a big scale, but we have sample like big panes of architecture of glass collected from the plants at different time intervals for different parts of the ribbon, and uh, that has been reported. Mm -hmm. Wait, stay right there, George. <laughs> I have a question for Titania, but, but perhaps you can help me answer. But uh, you know, so you're using some statistical criteria to make match. To, to set match, criteria, match judgments about, about samples. And particularly for a hypothesis test, the hypothesis tests are about the mean of the measurements. And so it's possible to say there is a difference in the means, although have samples in the two, you know, two uh, have measurements in the two samples overlap with one, another to some, one, one another to some extent, so that it would be possible for a measurement from, from one chemical sample to actually be closer to the measurements of another chemical sample, despite the fact that the hypothesis test s says there's a statistically different, statistically significant difference in the mean. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any experience with uh, talking to lawyers and, and uh, testifying in courts as to the results of such hypothesis tests? That's why I wanted you to stay up there, uh, uh, George, and you know, mention something about that. But uh, do you have any response to that? It's a statistical issue. That's one of the main problems that we all deal with uh, when we have to present the data in a, to a jury, how to explain that in lay term. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that's why uh, when we evaluate the match criteria, there is not perfect match criteria. There is always a compromise that is going to be between type 1 and type 2 errors. So we have to try to make uh, the best decision based on the data and then try to worry as a community to work a little bit more in the language what we say about it, and how we present that in court to make it understandable. So I think that uh, we as community can work on that. First, select the match criteria, no matter if it is difficult to explain, and then worry about how we are going to present that in an easy way for the jury to understand. That was a good saying. answer. Have you testified before? Anyway, I, I think that I'd like to thank all the uh, speakers this morning. They were all great, and, and uh, they'll be available for questions. We need to move on to our break, or we won't have one. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>